hey y'all. Hello. No, no, no. We in the South. So if I say, hey, y'all, I need to hear y'all back. Hey, y'all. How y'all doing? Good. Good people. Look to your left. Say hello. Hello. Look to your right. Say, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> My name is Shyante Jones, otherwise known as Shy. I am so excited to be here welcoming you today. I use she, her, hers, and all the pronouns that are given with respect. I'm the co-director of the Calibri Foundation and the chief reparations officer of the Cypress Fund. Welcome everyone. My name is Tania Duran. Um, uh, I use she, her pronouns and I'm with the Mary Reynolds, I'm so short, so you have to excuse me, <laughs> with the Mary Reynolds Babco Foundation. I'm also the co-chair of the convening planning with, with Chai and also co-chair of the NFT board. So it's very nice having you all here in Wilmington today. Yes, and I don't know that NFG has a program that I'm not in. <laughs> I was on the Amplify team. I am in the in Philanthropy Forward. I'm in the racial capitalism community. I sometimes go to those Midwest calls, even though I don't live in the Midwest. <laughs> I just don't know that NFG does something that I have not had the pleasure of being a part of. And I am super excited to be able to invite you all to Wilmington. It feels so good to see so many funders from all over this country, but more particularly, all of our North Carolina and South Carolina folks here together in one room, um, especially in a space that is so rout with racial hatred, with economic violence, with environmental violence. It feels phenomenal to be in a space that is centered around joy, connection, and gathering. Um, and connection for me means being able to hug my people being able to look at you and say, oh, you look good. Your twist out is great. I see you out there with that blowout. Come on, give me a little haircut. It feels like that, right? It feels like to be with my people and to compliment and to love up on them. Um, yes, and I started uh, with NFG. I started being involved with NFG in 2018 when Amy and Melody came to North Carolina to, to start talking about how does it look like to coke on fire here in North Carolina to make sure that resources are going to the communities that have been doing that work for the longest time, but they haven't been resourced. Um, and since then, I haven't, I haven't, you know, they cannot get rid of me and I love everything that they do. And I do really feel that NFG is my political home. I come from El Salvador. I have lived in North Carolina for 20 years, but just seeing so much resonance and how they speak to the concrete realities of our communities is really speak deeply um, to me. And what connection means to me, it, it's that, it's community, it's relationships that go beyond the titles, the roles, those real connections, so those real relationships that is what sustain movements, particularly in times like the ones that we live in. And also coming from the years that we have had with so much rapid change um, that have made visible the intersecting crisis that our communities have had for the longest time, but also the boldest and most exciting solutions that are coming also from these very same communities. So we're all funders, right? We all move money. And I'm super excited to talk about what does it mean to move money in this community, but I'm Gullah. So I'm gonna talk about what it means to move money to Gullah communities in the Carolinas. I would be nothing if it wasn't from where I'm from, right? Where is it from my people? Every grant strategy you've ever heard me talk about, any plenary you've ever heard me speak on, anything that has come out of Cyprus comes from a Gullah grandma, a Gullah auntie, a Gullah uncle from a fishing trip, from something like that. I do not bring anything but my community to this space, um, to philanthropy overall. And moving money to Gullah communities means we're more than just food and dancing. Now the food is bomb and the dancing is fire. <laughs> but we're more than that, right? We're talking about folks who are doing workforce development. We're talking about folks who are on the cutting edge of environmental changes, who are on the cutting edge of farming techniques, who are supporting Black children and figuring out what does it mean to speak Gullah at home and in your schools? What does it mean to protest when a bridge is connecting people who've never come to your land to a space and they're not respecting where you're from? Moving money for Gullah communities to me looks like retribution, it looks like redistribution, and it looks like joy in the deepest sense. It looks like community and it feels like home. So moving money in this region to me, it's making me weepy. It is all about how do I get to give back to the people that gave so much to me in a way where we don't code switch, 
we gonna sit and chat for a while. We gonna have some biscuits. I'm gonna come out and see your people. You gonna ask me about my granddaddy and them. I'm gonna ask you about your people and some churn probably gonna run through the streets. And that's what it means to move money in this region. It means moving slow and intentionally. Mm. Thank you. Mm. And for me, um, moving money to this region. So this morning, some of us went to the learning visit um, in Wilmington and Navasa. And for me, what it looked like, it's the stories that Ms. Risa Willis from Partners in Community share. I was so, there she is. <laughs> I was so inspired by each of the stories of resiliency and what Ms. Risa said, it's not just, you know, resilient, like just building back, but thriving and showing the way. I was so moved by the, how much, um, even the narratives that are told, like how much resistance and resilience, for example, the black press has had here in, in this area. So for me, moving money is really moving it to, to build power and to build it in all the possible angles, you know, not just the little boots on the ground, grounds that BIPOC led communities are told to do, but not funding also the strategy, not funding also the narratives, not funding also the culture. So for me, it looks like that. It's, it looks like giving the money back to the communities where this money came from. And, and yeah, so that was an exciting way to start. And this is the beginning of three days of, of wonderful connection at NFG. And I, I really welcome you all and I'm very excited to co-learn and co-conspire together. So we family now, right? Because we all, y'all done heard about our people. Okay. We've done share with y'all. Y'all have talked back to us. But before we get our first plenary underway, I want to thank everybody for coming together. I know how difficult it is physically to get here. Um, I also know we ain't been conferencing. We ain't been seeing people, right? So I appreciate you all for coming together, for honoring our COVID protocols, for uh, actually being in this space and want to give big thanks to our convening leading staff who did the amazing work. Um, so Elizabeth, Courtney, Manisha, the Amplify and C grantees, the NFG board, NFG members, if you haven't done your membership, go see Courtney in the jacket, um, our convening sponsors, um, all of those folks, and then every single one of you who've been here with us today coming together. And now I want to invite uh, Kaveri Banerjee Morthy, my fellow board co-chair to the stage. <laughs> Thank you all. Hello, everybody. Oh my gosh, that's low. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hi, um, I'm Kaberi Banerjee Murthy. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm at the Conrad Prebis Foundation, um, and I'm co-chair with Tanya of the board. Um, I've been on the board of NFG since October 2021. Um, I want to first start out with a huge thank you to Tanya and to Shai um, for all of the hard work that they have done, all of the contributions, and the uncountable number of meetings and Zooms that they have been in. So thank you. And as Shai said, I wanna thank everybody who made the journey here today. It is so powerful to look around and see all of your faces. And I am filled with so much excitement for all of the learning and conversations that will unfold over the course of the next three days. It is exciting to see so many friends in the room and it is really exciting to know that there will be even more friends made by the time we all depart. Um, I also want to be able to start us out by getting a sense of who is in the room to connect capital C here this week. Um, so if you are here for your very first NFG convening, holler or wave or make some noise. Welcome, welcome to all of y'all. Now wave your hand or holler if you joined NFG during the pandemic online um, for our 40th anniversary, uh, the virtual convening in 2022. Who all started then? Woo, all right, small but mighty crew, excellent. Um, if you were in our last in-person convening in 2018 in St. Louis, make some noise. Woo! Awesome. And now how about folks who have been here even longer? So wave your hand as, if you were in NFG in Albuquerque, in Jackson, Oakland. Okay, make some noise, people. Make some noise. Um, Los Angeles and Miami. 
Woo! All right, so we've got some folks who have been here for a while. We've got a lot of new folks in the room. For however long you've been with NFG, we are glad you are with us. Um, and we are really thrilled that you are here for the regathering um, for 2023 here in Wilmington. And for everybody on Zoom and in the virtual world, welcome as well. We are thrilled to be able to unfold these next three days. And I get to now have the pleasure of passing the mic to Amy, our interim president. Hey, NFG. It is so nice to be here with all of you in person in this room. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Amy Morris. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the interim president of NFG right now. Um, <laughs> NFG has been a part of my life uh, since I had my first full-time gig in philanthro land as a program officer at the Serdna Foundation. Um, I went to the 2010 convening in Minneapolis, which is now my home, um, and like quickly got pulled in, was a, became an active part of the Working Group on Labor Community Partnerships, now called Funders for a Just Economy. Um, ended up on the coordinating committee. I was on the planning committee for the Albuquerque convening. Um, I co-chaired the Jackson convening, ended up on the board. You stick around long enough here. You never know what you might get asked to do. Um, and then I was on the hiring committee that hired Dennis Quirin, our former president, who hired me back to come on staff as the first director of the Amplify Fund in 2017. Um, and it was for sure a homecoming. Um, in 2018, we're launching the Amplify Fund in at the St. Louis convening. And I'm sure like many of us, I never dreamed that would be the last time I would see all of you in one room at the same time until now, COVID. So it really like especially feels like home to be here in my political home in philanthropy with Neighborhood Funders Group uh, and in a room full of people who are working towards making our mission real, to organize philanthropy so that black, indigenous, people of color communities and low income communities thrive. And I'm really grateful that you all traveled all the way here to Wilmington to be here with us. Um, so Kaberi mentioned, I'm currently the interim president of NFG, been in this role since 2022. Lots of leaders love to talk about how they're standing on the legacy of those who came before them. Let me tell you, as interim, that's like really, really real. Um, and I just feel so grateful to be getting to build on the leadership of Adriana Rocha, who was the president before me. Um, the folks who were on the senior team with her, Sarita Huja and Farhan McLurkin. Before them, Dennis Quirin, and we could go back, right? The story goes back. Um, I feel wildly grateful for the leadership that all of those folks put into making NFG what it is today. And this organization that I have loved and so many of us love for so long is not about just them or just me or any one of us, even with these incredible co-chairs of the board, of the convening, the double co-chair, the co-co-chair. Um, it is really about us, all of us, right? The members in this room. It is our current senior management team, our interim vice president of programs, Manisha Vaze, out there somewhere, our brand new vice president of finance and operations, Lily Velez. Uh, it is our entire incredible staff team who is now 16 people strong. Wave your hands, please. It is our board who has so solidly welcomed me and stood by me in this role as I've taken on interim leadership. But mostly it's all of you, right? It's our members. It's the one, people who represent the 150 dues paying organizations that make up this organization, who are in our programs, who move programming with our staff every day. So I'm learning a lot as interim president about myself, about NFG. I knew it, but I'm like reminded every day now. I love change. I love holding people through transition. I love seeing what emerges, what comes as we walk. And I feel really honored to have the opportunity to help bring that change to life inside of NFG. And I really, like really, really, am looking forward to welcoming the next leader of NFG when it's time for that. <laughs> And I'm here to say, I'm gonna guess that person is probably in this room. So to you, 
whoever you are out there, or you, plural, whoever you are out there, and to all of you, our membership. I want you to know a little bit about what I and we as an organization have committed to do through this transition period. First thing is to lay a really solid foundation for the next leadership of NFG to be able to come in and stand in. This means focusing really intently on making some decisions about our leadership model. What does the role of leading NFG look like? How can we make sure it's a joyful, sustainable role that somebody relishes and wants to step into? How can we be sure that staff and board and members are all well positioned and set up to support a new leader in that role? And you know, we're gonna take our time with some of those questions. And so we're looking at um, really aiming to have those questions answered, to be able to launch a search and get someone in by like the middle, this time in two years, like the middle of 2025. So interim, yes, but we're gonna take our time and make sure we get it right so the next person is stepping into a role that's the right role or people. Second, if you haven't already heard, NFG is now a union organization. Our mighty staff union is represented by Communication Workers of America Local 9415. And we will finish negotiating our first collective bargaining agreement with our union before new leadership begins in this role. Thank you. <laughs> I think that might be the FJE crew in the back over there. Um, <laughs> we don't feel like a new, new leadership should step in in the middle of that process. We're gonna see it through um, and be able to hand a completed contract, a signed, completed, ratified contract off to new leadership. The last thing before new leadership comes on board is we're going to rebuild this muscle about gathering and regathering. Um, we've now, coming out of the pandemic, right, we've gathered staff already twice. The board's been together once. Philanthropy Forward Fellows have been together a handful of times. Programs, Amplify funders, grantees have been together in various configurations. And now here we are at a national convening for the first time since 2018. And we're really hoping that with your help this week, we can start to figure out what an NFG space feels like in this moment of these pandemic times. So this week, here we are, right? We're gathered to connect. So let's get down to like the challenging and inspiring conversations we've all been yearning to have in person over these pandemic years. But also, I really invite you to invest in all of the joys of being together with people in the same place a walk before breakfast, an extra drink after dinner, that conversation in the hallway while you're like late coming in the room for the session. Do all of that and enjoy everything there is here in Wilmington, North Carolina to learn about and enjoy. Um, I have to say, I, I really wanna so deeply express our gratitude as an organization to the dozens of Amplify Fund grantees and partners um, who have supported us, welcomed us, made this visit possible, made it real to be here in this community. For those of you who went on the learning visit this morning, I know you got a taste of that, and I think you get a taste of it more and more as the week goes on. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to our staff team. I just want to say, I know names have been said before, but you all need to know this convening has been in the works for like more than two years, and the core team that has brought this to life, uh, Manisha Vaze, Courtney Benayad, and Elizabeth Pham. Everything, just so much immense gratitude to this crew. I'm going to hand it over to Courtney and Elizabeth. Hello to everyone in the room, and hi to the folks tuning in on Zoom. I'm Courtney Benayad. I use she, her pronouns. I'm NFG's Director of Membership and Communications. And as you've heard, I am also one of our NFG staff team convening co-leads alongside Manisha Vaze, our Interim Vice President of Programs, and Elizabeth Pham, who will introduce herself now. Thank you, Courtney. Hey, y'all. Elizabeth Pham, she, her. Uh, senior operations manager, AKA convening co-lead among other things at NFG. Just like Amy said, if you stick around a long time, you never know what you're gonna be asked to do. But I've been trying to plan an in-person convening since I got to NFG over four years ago. However, we did have a great and successful 2020 virtual pivot for some of you. 
And I'm just so happy to be able to be here, welcome you all, and be able to celebrate with my convening colleagues and everyone in this room. I will say that um, even though many of, you, many of you didn't wave your hand or holler, I saw the Zoom registration reports in 2020 and know that there were hundreds of you that joined us online. Um, but very, very glad to be here in person with over 200 funders coming from all over the place, plus our Amplify Fund grantees, plus folks like LA and Risa who have helped us put this whole thing together. Uh, two quick logistics items, um, in addition to many others you'll hear about from Elizabeth soon. The Wi-Fi password for this space is, well, first the network is Hotel Ballast Meeting Room. The password is INSPIRE, I-N-S-P-I-R-E with a capital I, 2023. Haley McLean, NFG's new communications manager, has also added this information into your Whova app announcement, so you'll see it there. And then if you are using social media, we encourage you to use our hashtag NFG Connection, uh, which you'll also find in the Whova app. Uh, as you've heard Tanya and Shai and other folks say, this year's convening theme is connection. The entire program is rooted in joy, camaraderie, care, fun, and centered on moving money to BIPOC communities. Throughout your time here, connection mean, will mean a lot of things, including connecting to yourself. For many folks, this convening is the first time we've been in person after years of being virtual. So we truly, truly, truly encourage you to pace yourself. In the spirit of self-care and co-care, listen to your body's needs and tap into yourself and tune into how you would like to engage in this convening. This might look like going back to your room and resting during the breaks. It might look like taking a walk outside or sitting in the sunshine. We have beautiful weather this week. Uh, you might wanna share a meal with new or familiar friends either here at the hotel or at many of the wonderful restaurants in Wilmington. Again, shout out to Risa for helping us compile a list of restaurants on the convening website under the tab Local Eats. You'll also find a link to that in the Whova app. Um, or you might be dancing together at the Black Joy Space or the Cameron Art Museum tomorrow. However you spend your time connecting this week, again, please connect to yourself first. We also want you to connect to fellow grant makers and the BIPOC leaders who are building power here in this place. Connect to the land and the community here in Wilmington. Immerse yourself in opportunities to learn about the historical context of Wilmington and the implications for our work today. Right outside of this room, you're going to find beautiful posters that were created for this event for you to learn more. Um, you should definitely, again, attend our Black Joy Space tonight and tomorrow's celebration at the Cameron Art Museum. Have conversations with our Amplify Fund grantee partners who are here to meet all of us and uh, the grant makers that are funding in Gullah and Geechee communities. This convening theme of connection is also very much linked to our COVID community care agreements. You'll see that those of us on stage, we have taken our masks off. We all checked in with each other ahead of time to make sure that was okay. We did our daily rapid testing, which we're asking all of you to do as well. Um, because we're mindful of the many and conflicting tensions and realities of this moment. It's our intention to convene in a way that honors our commitments to self-determination, de self caregiving, community, and collective wellness. This means being in reflection and dialogue about who we are accountable to, what we all need to be safe and well, and holding our logistics with care and integrity. So again, we encourage you to take good care this week. Get the sunshine, whatever you might need. Maybe it's an ice cream cone. If you're walking around Wilmington, I will say, I was smelling the waffle cones before I even saw the ice cream place. Whatever care looks like for you, go after it. Uh, I'm gonna pass the mic back to Elizabeth for a few more logistics things, and we'll soon be underway with our very first plenary. All right, thanks, Courtney. So just a few more items before we keep going. You all got your Hoover apps on your phones. It's gonna be your best friend. You're gonna find out all the programming on there, where, is it, where it's gonna be, what time it's the Black Joy event, et cetera. But you're all gonna be able to self-organize, have meetups, you know, connect with other folks who are attending the convening. And then towards the end of the convening, you'll get a little reminder in the Hoover app to please go to our survey. 
click on it and please provide feedback. We wanna hear from you. Did you have a great time? Did you all connect? Did you make the meaningful connections that you wanna take action upon after leaving the convening? We wanna hear that. And of course, feel free to also tell us in our ears when you see us in the hallway as well. But definitely fill out that survey so that we can have good data and be you know, back at planning for a better convening the next time we meet. A um, few more logistics. So restrooms are on each floor of the hotel. However, the gender inclusive restroom is on level three. It's labeled clearly, please respect folks' choice of restrooms. As for your convening meals, you've had a few already. Feel free to take your plates with you into the plenary as some of you had done. Uh, go outside into the Riverview Terrace for some sun. Feel free to take it to your room if that is what makes you comfortable. And the last thing is there's photographers, uh, hi, and videographers that will be around at some of the events. If for some reason you do not want or you want to opt out, uh, please just go see our fabulous team, Jordan and others at the registration table and uh, just let them know that you want to opt out. So I'm going to pass it back to you. OK, I promise we're really, really close to getting started. Uh, last but not least, just appreciating again everyone in this space and our convening sponsors, who I'm now going to thank by name. Feel free again if you're here. Do your thing. Let us know who you are. We really, really appreciate your sponsorship. Uh, Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation. Calibri Foundation, Cypress Fund, Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. I feel like I'm giving out prizes. Like, come on up and get your prize. Common Council Foundation, Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, Chinook Fund, Rakes Foundation, Kresge Foundation, Hill Snowden Foundation, The Needmore Fund, Butler Family Fund, The Heinz Endowment, Series Trust, Serdna Foundation, the Colorado Health Foundation, North Star Fund, Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, Mertz Gilmore Foundation, Deaconess Foundation, New York Foundation, Threshold Philanthropies, Center for Economic Democracy, Solidaire Network, and Anonymous. And now, Shai, please come rejoin us on stage. Thank you all so much. Have a great week. All right, y'all, I'm back again. Excited to get to keep inviting you all into space and welcoming you all here. I see so many warm and friendly spaces. I'm so grateful to get to open up the First plenary, that's about the roots of racial capitalism in Eastern North Carolina and the South. So if you know me and you've heard me talk, you know I am Gullah. I can trace my family lineage back to the boat and to the indigenous folks who mix to make me who I am. I am the product of racial capitalism in this country. And growing up in a small town in South Carolina as a very queer, very outspoken, very loud, chatty, questioning Black femme, it was hard. I don't think that is a surprise to anyone who carries any of the identities that I carry. And I left South Carolina. I never thought this would be a place that I would call home. I thought the South was not meant for someone like me. And in my connection to NFG and my coming back, it's a part of my coming home story. I can tell you that my connection to Amplify came from Brian Parlamuter, who is in this room, <laughs> who sent me a job description and was like, hey, I think you might want to apply for this consultant role right after I left Solidaire Network, right? It was like, oh, well, maybe. I applied for the job and I talked to Amy and Melody and I was like, hey, I'm from South Carolina. I know a bunch of people in South Carolina, knowing that I hadn't been home in a little while, but I had been home, but I hadn't really been home. So I got the job and then I started Cypress Fund with Brian and David and Maggie, knowing that there was something at home for me. There needed to be a place where people that looked like me, that loved like me, that were loud like me, that were black, 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 like me, needed to be able to come home and be free. I wanted to come back because my grandma and them still live here. 
my cousins still go to school here. My granddaddy drives three and a half hours to work in a factory here. This is my place, this is my home. And the first few years of Amplify was making family. It was realizing that I had more community than I thought, that there was so much more for me here than the horrors of hog farms, the terrors of legislation that didn't see me and honor who I was, the stairs as I walked around with head wraps. There was biscuits with Risa, and there was sweetness with Devon. There was conversations with Miss Sue Perry Cole. There was sweet potatoes on Fresh Future Farms. There was so much love, so much joy. There was Kiki's with LA, right? This connection for me of Amplify is really a story of how I, someone who's queer, black, loud, femme, intellectual, joyful, silly, chatty. If you catch me on a good day, I'll drop a good 16 for you. That's, I don't wanna do that here. Maybe, maybe later on tonight, <laughs> right? But there was space for someone like me to call this place home. And there was a way that I could make this space better for the people who didn't get to leave and who didn't want to, for the people who also call this place home. And there was a way through NFG, through Amplify for us to talk about the hard stuff, but also the joyful stuff. So I am, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Also, I love my grandma. So let me not, you know, let me shout out Barbara. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you know anything about me, you know that this space, this moment feels like the biggest homecoming that I could have had in my return back to South Carolina. So I'm excited to share that we're gonna start with a video that features Amplify grantees, um, like the ones that I've lifted out. And you're gonna hear from organizers from different counties across Eastern North Carolina who share more about how they're organizing, um, who they're organizing with and around building power for climate justice, housing justice, disaster relief, mutual aid, worker justice, and even bigger than that, building joy and fun and sweetness and relief and rest. North Carolina is 80% rural, with the concentration of those rural communities landing in eastern North Carolina. The issues that Black and Brown communities face in North Carolina is intersectional. We don't have the luxury to choose between one mode of oppression when all are weighing down as a burden on our shoulders. One of the things that you'll see is the environmental racism that Eastern North Carolina has to face. There's a lot of overlap between the community's race in terms of being black or indigenous or brown. There's overlap with being low income, being rural. So when you're talking about an industry that's actually gonna scrub away what's remaining of the wetlands, of tree cover that helps to buffer against storm surge and such, you're really actually continuing the victimization of an entire people, which is not unheard of across the United States. Hurricane prediction is very serious for our region. In Eastern North Carolina, we don't have many large urban areas. It takes years to recover from storm damage and storm surge. A lot of the county leaders, state leaders, stakeholders, they aren't aware of the Hispanic community. When hurricane season comes around, they put out warnings, but they forget to put bilingual information out there. It impacts affordable housing, it impacts agriculture, it impacts your tax base, it leads to population decline. Historically in our nation, communities of color have faced targeting by dirty corporations, unfair wages by the same corporations, and then entrenchment of power by politicians who have prioritized corporate profit and greed over the people's needs. Over 80% of North Carolina is considered food insecure, with the majority of those food deserts being located in Eastern North Carolina. We have stood arm in arm, link in link to provide the food that we need that is culturally relevant and healthy and sustainable in the absence of grocery stores and food insecure zones. 
One of the issues that ABC2 is trying to address in the community is food insecurity. One of the maps that I made in collaboration with the Upper Plain Council of Governments, and what they wanted for each county was to be able to understand variables of poverty, household income in the areas, as well as being able to compare all the variables together to see areas where that are lacking of access. During the pandemic, a lot of people lost their jobs. So what Amexican did is they established a food pantry, partnering with the Food Bank of Eastern North Carolina that provides cultural appropriate food boxes to the families. Beans, rice, oil, maseca, chiles, tomatoes, it's regular residents from these disinvested communities who come and talk about their needs and their priorities and their ideas for shaping policy changes that can improve their neighborhoods. I was involved in litigation in 1983 to bring about the Black majority on the Rocky Mount City Council. It never occurred to me then that 40 years later, I'd still be fighting the same battle of redistricting with local residents to make sure that the constitutional promises are actually carried out. Blueprint, they've been a solid partnership for us just to strengthen our advocacy and civic engagement program by helping the Latino community to register to vote, not just the presidential elections, but the other elections in their counties as well. Voting rights is enormously important. We're a battleground state. And I think that the South as a whole is going through a transition where this black-white divide, African-Americans and Latinx can change the trajectory of the country. Even in the face of adversity, the communities of Eastern North Carolina hold joy in resiliency. Every day, community leaders, community organizations, and community members work together for the promise of a better future. A lot of the larger funders really don't get down to the nitty gritty. They are content to fund the larger state level organization, but you need people on the ground who can actually reach down and touch these people in the hard to serve communities. People in Eastern North Carolina, they know what they want to be changed. They know what they want the future to look like. Amplify is a good example of what can happen when a philanthropic group has an intention to reach down to the grassroots level and provide funding to the people that are directly impacted by policy change. The thing I would want funders to know about Eastern North Carolina is that despite whatever they've faced over centuries, not decades, still here, still fighting, still working hard, and really thriving in many ways. And so any bit that they can do to help folks thrive even more, why not? I'm so excited to welcome to the stage LA, Lamisha Whittingfield to come and talk about a little bit of the history and context for what we just saw in this video. Now, y'all don't know, I love me some shy, okay? Y'all don't even, we came together through the Amplify process. So through Amplify, I have found friends, family, literally, Nicole, where are you? We found out we were cousins, right? <laughs> Whittington and Washington, who would have, I, I, I mean, really? Um, but good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, and I am the same person. I just want to note that before we get into the discussion today, before I can officially welcome you to Eastern North Carolina, we're going to have to really talk about the power of Eastern North Carolina, right? I have to give you, uh, I'm the tour guy, uh, before we get into a very deep discussion with an incredible, formidable panel. Uh, but I'm the same person. So when you hear people say Lamicia or LA, it's the same person, the streets name me. So LA is it, it is, um, and deep in, in community. Um, so when we talk about the roots of racial capitalism, 
we have to understand the history because roots don't grow overnight. Now, do they? No. It is a deep entrenchment of time, evolution, and the proper environment by which the roots can thrive. But in addition to the roots of extraction, we have to talk about the roots of power, the roots that actually provide the sustenance by which capitalism leeches from. That's Eastern North Carolina. In the tradition of North Carolina, in the tradition of black communities and brown communities, we heard growing up that you have to be 10 times better, 10 times smarter, 10 times faster. Have some of us heard that growing up? Mm -hmm. And it's okay, y'all can say, say so. I love good energy. So we're gonna wake up just a little bit, just a little bit, keep that momentum that Shy and Tanya kept us in. We're gonna keep it going. But we were told that we had to be 10 times better and stronger, but we weren't told that we'd have to be 10 times better and stronger than the pollution that was dumped into our communities. They didn't tell us we'd have to be 10 times better than the food insecurity and our children being hungry as they were going to school to learn life lessons that were supposed to help them move in socioeconomic mobility. They didn't tell us that 10 times better really meant that we had to be 10 times more resilient. And I have a love-hate relationship with the word resiliency. Fannie Lou Hamer said it best, I'm tired of being tired. Resiliency means I'm planning to lose and I just know how to beat it. No, I wanna learn how to win, right? So even when we heard uh, First Lady, former First Lady Michelle Obama say, when they go low, we go high, it quite literally meant that we had to be 10 times better and we had to be and rise above the haters, the extractors, the development corporations, and everybody who continued to test us while extracting our labor for their economic benefit and the power of this empire that we call the United States of America. Mm. So this tradition and our roots of excellence of being 10 times better, we've stepped up to it and we're 20, 30, 40, 50 times better because we shouldn't still be alive. But it is a spiritual reason that we are still here carrying on the mantle of our ancestors. We are our ancestors, that is Eastern North Carolina. Our collective power built this nation in Turtle Island, which is actually where we are, right? Let's talk about it. There was already a people here, and I'm Afro-Indigenous, so I could talk about it a little bit, all right, y'all? We already had systems of government. Why do you think over 24 states still have the indigenous names? Minnesota, Michigan, Arizona, New Mexico, we can keep going. Why do we think in North Carolina, there's an Ahoski, a Kuratuk, a Kulawi? What do we think those words mean? Even Tuskegee Airmen, indigenous names. Appalachian, which is where I'm from. Our tribes erased, but our landscape name, they didn't know to erase that. Oh, the signs are hidden. But they saw that our land was thriving and prosperous because the stewards of the earth, we knew how to take care of Mother Earth because she's our mother and in turn, she would nurture us. But it was ripe for the picking, strange fruits. Come on. So when we talk about even the terminology of land and a fruit and uh, the abundance, it was used and weaponized for again, economic gains. So the land of Native Americans and indigenous and Afro-Indigenous was stolen. We were murdered and through genocide, whether it was materially or through paper genocide, and many of our people still don't know who we are because the census was used years later to erase us. Mulatto, right? We can keep going. The same thing happened in the Southwest when folks were removed or murdered. We talk about the Mexican wars, and now that we call it Texas, that was Mexico. The border was dropped on the people. Come on. And promises were given in treaties that was then reneged by Congress. And folks who were supposed to have 152 thriving communities in Texas that were from Mexico, it is now, what, lower than 40, if that, today? The same mode of operation that happened sweeped across the nation for land. And once that land was extracted and the people were removed, then the people were moved around like assets. Some were moved into the U.S. chattel slavery, and we also know the slave trade of the African peoples who were brought here. And so there were several systems of plantations that now built the economic labor that we are seeing as the legacy in Eastern North Carolina. When we talk about roots of racial capitalism, you have to understand the plantation wasn't just agriculture. People didn't get paid after they harvested the plant. They also were enslaved when they manufactured it. They were also enslaved when they served the product. They were also enslaved when they had to put it on the ships as it went over across the seas because you understand slavery was an international conglomerate by which our labor produced 
Port pollution today was port pollution then. Climate change then, now was climate change then. It's nothing new. So when we hear about today the lack of health care and health insurance, honey, that was the industrial plantation. When we talk about waiters and wait staff, honey, that was the service plantation. When we talk about drivers and boatmen, when we talk about all these individuals, farm workers, and the fact that they need respect as farmers, being that they actually know the land. Mm. This started with the plantation model. So then if we actually saw the extraction of what is happening today in the intersection, we would understand that it started plantation and by the stroke of a policy pen, it went to a corporation. All they did was refurbish it. But in Eastern North Carolina, we thrived. In the wake of emancipation, 187 North Carolinians were elected, Black elected officials, only 25 to 30 years after the Civil War. Eastern North Carolina was so powerful with electoral power that they called it the Black Second and the first racial gerrymandering happened at the top of the 1900s, right after Wilmington 1898 massacre because we had several Wall Streets. We were too powerful. We had a kingdom with two kings and a queen. We were too powerful. Not just one Wall Street in Durham, but one in Wilmington, one in Greenville, and probably many others that we don't know about because they continue to try to bury us as roots. But as roots, we continue to thrive. So as you hear this panel, you have to understand that we are talking about the intersection of our identities and the intersection of climate injustices, environmental injustices. Population has exploded with over a million new people since the last census. When we talk about Southeast Brunswick County's number one, as the hardest were telling me over, over lunch this week as so many others, and can all the Eastern North Carolina grantees raise your hand, please? I need to give honor to my elders. That's right. So as we discuss with this panel, the intersection and the work and the labor that they are moving, our issue areas are converged. So when we talk about food insecurity, we also understand that fast food restaurants target those areas and those fast food restaurants have chemicals in their packaging from the same company that dumped it in the Cape Fear River. Do you understand? Do you follow where I'm going? There is no difference when we are talking about oppression on a people. It is land and it is labor, but we are, yes, resilient, but we are winning. So as we begin to wind down my comments, I want to encourage folks that as I'm giving you the landscape of Eastern North Carolina, as I've given you the landscape that while our ancestors toll actually created the supply chain, we were moving to supply labor on plantations in chains. So as we talk today about how to unburden and unchain our communities who have for generations lived only a few miles from these former plantations, now corporations, it's not a shock that the dirtiest corporations live in our communities. Over 56% of all black people live only two miles away from a toxic waste site and breathe in more pollution than we actually create. It is because the land was cheaper, but the people were so powerful that they still needed us for our toll. Run us our check government and everyone else. So as I urge you to continue on in this labor with us, I can officially welcome you to Eastern North Carolina. Because mm -hmm. we will have black joy tonight, right? But right now, it's black stories, black pain, black legacy, black truth. And then you can celebrate with us because you are our co-conspirators, all right? And afterwards, there's a plenary at 3.30, that Melody and I will be leading. And I hope that we will see you in that plenary, right, uh, to talk about co-conspiratorship just a little bit more. But welcome to the roots of capitalism, but welcome to the roots of Eastern North Carolina. And I welcome the panel to join me. Yeah, I don't know why they let me ever be talking. Y'all got to lay up here, y'all. <laughs> so many amazing folks. Uh, coming to the stage to join us, Ms. Sue Perry Cole, Curtis Hill, Darlene Adam, and Chris Shuggs. Can we get a round of applause as folks are coming on up the stairs? It's so good to see y'all. Hi. So we are gonna start hearing some stories from uh, Ms. Sue Perry Cole. Good afternoon. 
My name is Susan Perry Cole. I'm the president and CEO of the Asso North Carolina Association of Community Development Corporations. Our mission is to strengthen communities and increase opportunities. I'm located in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, which is about 130 mile, 39 mile drive from where we are now in Wilmington, headed toward the border between North Carolina and Virginia. I wanna thank the Amplify Fund leadership for giving me the opportunity to participate on this panel today and share my thoughts. Speaking of racial capitalism, the legacy of racial capitalism is still present in this country today in the form of persistent economic disparities and racial inequities. Black and brown communities are often disproportionately impacted by inequities in access to a range of social and economic benefits such as housing, healthcare, and employment. To address these issues, we need to address the root causes of racial capitalism, which are deeply intertwined with systemic racism and equity gaps. The most important action, however, that we can take, we need to center the voices and experiences of those most impacted by racial capitalism and equity gaps. This means working in partnership with black and brown communities to promote the direct participation of those impacted residents in the development and implementation of solutions and policy decisions that directly impact them. I wanna focus my remarks today on the affordable housing crisis occurring in my home community of Rocky Mount. One thing I wanna make clear is that North Carolina was ranked among the top three states for population growth between the period July 2021 and July 2022. During this period, the Tar Heel State added 133,000 residents. So what impact is North Carolina's rapid population growth having on housing affordability in the triangle and surrounding areas. The COVID-19 pandemic and the rise of remote work accelerated a mass migration happening across the country as people are fleeing big cities on the coast for less dense areas where the cost of living is more affordable. The influx of newcomers, particularly ones classified as high er er earners, into North Carolina and the Triangle is having a key impact on local housing markets. Out-of-state buyers, many coming from higher priced real estate markets, helped drive up home prices to record levels in recent years. In the supercharged economy of the Triangle, which is experiencing the double whammy of already expensive housing and now higher mortgage rates, which have doubled from a year ago, Many buyers have been priced out of the market of both owning and renting as that has become more expensive. While parts of Raleigh are experiencing max massive growth in the luxury housing market, it's communities further out like Rocky Mount that are beginning to experience gentrification pr pressures to accommodate families looking for more space in homes that are more affordably priced. Let me just give you a couple of facts about Rocky Mount. Rocky Mount is located 57 miles of east, east of Raleigh. The city straddles Nash and Edgecombe counties. Both of these counties are ranked as most economically distressed by the state of North Carolina. The city's population in 2020 was about 54,000 people, 63% of which are black and a little over 31% are white residents. Nearly 20% of Rocky Mount's population lives in poverty. In a recent assessment of housing needs, Rocky Mount's most significant housing problem was identified as cost burden. In Rocky Mount, there are 14 under-resourced neighborhoods. Many are clustered around the central downtown district. These neighborhoods suffer from high vacancy and blight symptomatic of disinvestment. These neighborhoods are also racially segregated and impoverished. However, economic expansion and transformation is occurring 
as Rocky Mount recently invested $48 million in the development of a downtown event center. Now, Rocky Mount's downtown revitalization strategies, coupled with growing gentrification pressures em emanating from the Triangle region, create a unique opportunity for impacted community residents to voice authentic demands for the development and implementation of affordable housing policies that directly impact them and will maintain their residency. I want to highlight a few activities that we are engaged in with, as far as community organizing and power building in Rocky Mount. NCACDC recognizes that power is fundamental to transforming equitable conditions in communities. The only thing that moves public policy into being is power. Our civic engagement activities are based on the notion that power comes from building a strong grassroots base of those impacted by the problems that communities face to increase their collective power. I mean by that the capacity of the group to realize its common goals and then using that collective power to insert to exert pressure on systems and agencies on behalf of the changes that they seek. NCACDC's goal is to continue to refine a people-centered proactive model of community change that starts with the premise that those most impacted by the problems and disparate conditions facing low wealth communities of color must be at the center of community change efforts. NCACDC is providing support and training to a cadre of civically engaged, low-income Black grassroots readers in Rocky Mount who possess the capacity to function as powerful change agents, raising their voices to make authentic demands for change. Incorporating authentic demand strategies into community change efforts creates an infrastructure to engage large numbers of impacted residents quickly and meaningfully in neighborhood planning efforts and policy development processes. We have a group in Rocky Mount called the Community Academy, which is comprised of local residents from these disinvested neighborhoods who have come together to improve affordable housing conditions in their blighted communities. Through the Community Academy, NCA CDC is working to strengthen the number and skills of residents impacted by housing disparities by providing education, training, and leadership development. We help them craft relationships and we support grassroots led civic participation and solution oriented activities. NCA CDC delivers services through the Community Academy that increase resident based expertise to enhance the power, participation, and voices of marginalized residents. Currently, NCA CDC is focused on civic participation of marginalized Black residents in Rocky Mount to implement the Rocky Mount Affordable Housing Strategic Plan. The Affordable Housing Plan includes nine recommendations to improve Rocky Mount's affordable housing situation. These include recommendations such as pass an affordable housing bond, uh, create a community land trust, and amend the city's accessory dwelling ordinance. Through the Community Academy efforts, NCA CDC is now focused on securing a million dollar allocation for the adoption of a, an enhanced down payment assistance policy to provide affordable housing financing opportunities to improve their quality of life. I want to conclude by stating, based upon NCA CDC's experience with power building work in Rocky Mount, we have learned that producing community driven system change outcomes requires long term investment, perhaps as long as a 10 years in increasing the capacity of people to lead these efforts. Thank you. All right, my name is Curtis Hill and I'm with the Columbus County Forum Inc. And as you can tell, I'm a person with a physical disability and my disability is cerebral palsy, okay? But we're gonna take you on a journey a little bit down the road about an hour 
west of here to a place called Columbus County. The county seat is called Whiteville, okay? It's rural, real rural, about 55,000 people or so like that in the area. Um, about 30% of the population is African American, right? Then you have about maybe two or 3% um, indigenous um, communities um, of the Waccamaw Suwan tribe that's there and the city town of Lake Waccamaw. So that is the area that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna take you on a journey. The journey of the Columbus County Forum began around 2017 or something like that. We started doing community development, community work in our community. I used to do um, outreach um, through political parties and that kind of thing. And it just something about that conversation just didn't sit well with me. After you would do all the campaigning and all that kind of thing, your community was the same. So we said, well, we got to do something to change our community. And so we came up with this idea of having an organization called the Columbus County Forum. And you might say, what in the world would somebody name an organization a forum? That's just odd and unique to do. So the board members and things, they said, well, we have got to listen to folks, right? So it's important for us to listen. And so we would begin to have these community conversations that was transforming not only what I understood by living there, but also really hearing and listening to folks and their experiences. And so out of that component, we were able to build a plan of action to deal with their issues. Because we realize that what's always got to that you always got to be proximate with folks, right? That means I've always got to understand them in order to help them. And so I always, even though I'm part of the community, I don't know every issue, right? I don't know every issue, so I've got to come and learn something about the community, and respect the community and information that they give me. Right. And then I say, well, how are we going to deal with the information? I would say, well, you know, and sometimes we say, well, we going to have a whole lot of people in the room. <laughs> that can be good at times and not so good at times, as all of you all know. But what it brings to us is talking about the issues that are core. You got to build trust in that community. Trust is what we talk about. We talk about your issues and how they impact your life. Because we realize that if I come, all of us know what the issues are. We got environmental problems in Eastern North Carolina. We've got housing issues in North, Eastern North Carolina. We got an educational issue in North Carolina. We've got all these things. We got job issues. We got environmental hazards. All of that stuff happens at our back door. And so often folks sit there and say, I'm hopeless in the middle of the storm that I'm dealing with. But but I tell you, we we develop a plan with them and conversations with them, and we build strategic plans about how to deal with those issues. And you might say, well, how do you do that? How do you do that? But the re how you do it is you listen to folks and you take all the information and all your expertise and you center it there. And then you say, well, it's time for us to lead it together in partnership together. It's not my idea, it's their idea, right? So then you say, well, well how do you move from there? And then we sit there and we start registering voters educating them about the civic engagement process. Because so often folks, you know, we in Eastern North Carolina where folks didn't have, they, they would vote, but they didn't understand voting processes, right? It was because somebody else told them to vote and that's who they voted for. They didn't understand who was on the ballot or what the issues were. It was because somebody brought a piece, a brown paper bag of money around and that's how you voted. Yeah. That's real. That's my reality. I don't know about yours. Um, but in the midst of that, so you've got to be able to give people power to say, look, hold up here. I understand they're giving you the money, but think about the issue. Educating them daily. It's not something that I just do um, civic engagement work. We do a 365, right? Every day. Bringing, talking to folks about the issues that impact their personal communities. You might say, well, hi, what are you talking about here? I've got some real life examples for you about Columbus County. And I'm sure you all probably heard about some situations that happened in 2020 um, um, in CD9, right? That was in Bladen County where you had um, this guy named McCray Dallas. It was on national news, right? He talks about how he was able to harvest votes in the area. That's in Bladen County. That's about 30 miles away from here. Uh, 
um, in that county, he was harvesting votes. You might say, harvesting votes? What does that got to do with this? He was going around getting people's ballots, absentee ballots, making sure their ballots didn't make it to the whole polls, right? That's harvesting votes that he was doing. It was illegal, but this is the culture, right? If somebody comes to me and asks me for my ballot, I'm like, yo, what are you talking about? I'm going to handle my own stuff. But if you're in a place where you've got low literacy and all these things, people are able to manipulate the process. So you've got to understand this is the kind of culture in which we're dealing with. Not only was he in Bladen County, he was also, also in Columbus County. And we're talking about four years, almost four years ago, right, doing the same work, right? And you might say, well, what does that have to do with Columbus County? Well, we went, we went. We went with our Blueprint partners and our friends, and we were going because we had an African-American sheriff in Columbus County for the first time ever. He was up for re-election. He lost by 34 votes to a guy who didn't even live in the county. I'm telling you the truth, y'all. He lived in an RV. <laughs> it's, yes. And we went to the state board of the state board of elections and talked about that and went to all those places. And but they still ruled that he had a right to live here in that space. Then also, if we fast forward a couple, I guess last year sometime, y'all probably heard something in the news where they were talking about somebody that said a sheriff that said some very derogatory statements about people of color. I'm sure y'all heard about that, right? That's right. So. And you say, well, what do you do in a community like that? You keep organizing. In the middle of that, we also had an education issue. Well, we had African American, we had three African American principals in our schools, four in our two school systems in our area, and now we have zero. Did y'all hear what I said? Did I tell you? But that doesn't stop the work that we're doing. In the midst of that, we were able to galvanize our community where the community were coming together. We had three and 400 people in the room talking about these issues and developing plans and doing direct action. It wasn't about me, it was about they felt the need to transform their community, right? And from that education meeting, we are able to get, for the first time ever, every seat on the school board was contested by people of color. That's building power. That's not talking about it. That's talking about building the power that needs to transform your community. Now, they didn't all win, but they ran, right? That means we're not going to take it anymore. We're going to put my name on the ballot. We're going to transform our community because we believe in it, because we realize we have to stay here every day. Then as we go talking about him, um, our sheriff and that kind of thing, when it, whatever he said, we were able to get folks, <laughs> we were able to get people to the room, stand, even though we understood the demographics of Columbus County, African-Americans are 30% of the population. That means we only have about, you know, that means we don't have a lot of, a lot of say. But what we were able to do in our community was to give people hope. I realized the whole time the probability, and I had one of my senior folks tell me, son, you got to understand that it's not really about what you're doing, right? It's about what that community is about. Because he said, it's a possibility this man is going to win his reelection. And I said, you know, you know, you're thinking about that. Like, well, no, nah, it can't happen. But then you think about it, and he does. But we didn't stop the fight then. You know what we did? We still organized, and right now to this day, he is not the sheriff for our community because we organized. If it was not for us on the ground organizing the community, he would still be the sheriff of our county, still harassing folks in our community with $3 million worth of military equipment to harass black and brown people. This is what we were living under for the last four years. This is why the work that we're doing in community is so power powerful because it has direct impact on folks' lives every day. Thank you again. Greetings from Burgall, Pender County, North Carolina. Today, I am thankful and grateful to share a space with so many of you trailblazers. If you're in this space at this appointed time, you are a trailblazer. Yes, 
a trailblazer. You are, you, yes, you are a trailblazer. What you learned today about Eastern North Carolina and Eastern North Carolina organizers and organizations will be a game changer for tomorrow. I am a lifetime resident of Pender County. I was born, raised, and educated in Burgall, North Carolina and Pender County. Pender County was, was established in 1875 and named for a Confederate Army general named William D. Pender. The county seat is Burgall, North Carolina. It is named for a group of Native Americans who lived along a creek in Western Pender County. We have banks, government facilities, municipalities, and a satellite hospital and a satellite community college. Our product that we have is blueberry. That's our primary food product is blueberries. We have the North Carolina Blueberry Festival every year in June. Our other, our other products are sweet potatoes, peanuts, strawberries, tobacco, soybeans, peanuts, and grapes. Corporations such as Walmart and others are present in our community. Pender County includes Topsail Island, one of North Carolina prized beaches. In addition, it includes miles of intracoastal and inland waterway, such as Cape Fear River, which has played an important role in the development of the county since the American Revolution. Affordable real estate affordable real estate and a growing economy are impacting the county. But today, I'm going to share with you a piece of what we do. My name is Darlene Adams, and I'm the founder and CEO of Pender United, an organization that was born out of a need, a natural disaster named Hurricane Florence. It devastated this area in 2018. Massive destruction, more lost than I've ever seen in my entire life. As a business owner and a community leader, people needed help. I'm a little nervous up here. Go on, on tell my story. So many people, so much lost. It brings tears to your eyes. People began to call my telephone number. They began to come to my home. And they said to me, what are we going to do? Our house is underwater. We have nothing. So I said to them, well, we're going to do what we always have done. We're going to trust God. Once I said that, my telephone rang. This wasn't a person looking for help. This was my neighbor. Risa Willis from Brunswick County said, the people of Pender County need help. What you gonna do? You have boots on the ground? They're your people. What are you going to do? So I turned and now I need more courage. And I looked up and I said, God, what do you want me to do? He was kind of quick this time. Usually he take his time and ask. He, he was kind of quick this time. And he said, 
I want you to listen and do and use what's in your hands. I'll take care of the rest. I'll send people from all over the United States and they're gonna provide resources to help you. I just need you to do the work. So after that, I just sat and I just kind of thought about what the work would be. And I thought, then I thought. So I said, okay. Risa called again and said, you going to work? What you gonna do? So I got up and I went to work. And the work began. We started with organizing. See, I didn't know what organizing was. I was used to network marketing and relational organizing in, in business. So we began organizing. So I did what she did. I called everybody that I knew in different communities. And I said, hey, I need your help. I called my neighbor who was a photographer and a videographer. I said, I need you to take pictures of everything in Pender County underwater. I need you to go out. I need your wife to do this. And I began to make those telephone calls. But I didn't know I was organizing at that time. The next, the next challenge was advocacy. We were thrown out of the long-term recovery group, a group that's supposed to help disaster victims. We were not allowed. We were African-American, female-led, with over 20 years of experience in disaster recovery, but we were not allowed because our permanent suntan was just too much for them to stand. So today I stand here glad that I got kicked out of long-term recovery group because I wouldn't be here with you guys today because I would have focused on that, but that wasn't my assignment nor my journey. Our work today consists of food insecurity, climate changes, digital technology, and artificial intelligence, and advocacy. Food insecurities doesn't just affect people, but the environment. Climate changes influence weather patterns, causing heat waves, healthy, heavy rainfalls, and drought, which also lead, lead to crop failures and food shortage. In addition, food waste is a global problem. That, undermine, that undermines health, healthy diets, food access and food insecurities for our communities are intertwined with equity and social justice issues. We are working with local farmers to provide healthy food choices, developing opportunities for communities to have local gardens and teaching community members on how to implement healthier diets. Literacy, the issue is not a literacy problem of the ability to read and write. It is, it can be defined as the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Processes have changed, y'all. Technology is a big part of the change. Now we must embrace the changes and learn what processes. Learn new processes, unlearn old habits, and relearn the processes. I work with drone technology and artificial intelligence assist in creating job opportunities and economic development in communities. We address food insecurities using it for connecting, empowering, and inspiring the communities. We utilize the resource in the community and build capacity to work. We teach, train community members and the community to work together. We are stronger when we work together. Advocacy affordable housing, available housing, homelessness. We're out there every day advocating for, for sustainable housing. We're still working with community members who have been displaced since 2018. Hurricane preparation, planning and recovery 
are crucial parts of our work, educating members on the importance of preparation, planning, and recovering, creating community hubs and information sites. In conclusion, this is an opportunity for you to learn about Eastern North Carolina and to do. We have incredible organizers, incredible organizations. In the beginning, I said that we're, filled, we're a room full of trailblazer. This is your opportunity to answer your call, be a trailblazer and invest in Eastern North Carolina. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Suggs. I have the honor of serving as executive director and founder of Kinston Teams. In 2014, I realized that the young people in my community weren't getting a fair chance. From the increased crime, poverty, and lack of jobs to the larger issues that played our city throughout history. This led me at 14 years old to founding Kinston Teams, a nonprofit organization with the mission of empowering young people through service, leadership, and civic engagement. Before I get into Kinston Teams, Kinston and the work we do, I want to provide some context on what has informed my community organizing work in recent years and how it ties into our discussion on racial capitalism in East North Carolina. After graduating from Kinston High School in 2017, um, I decided to attend college at UNC Chapel Hill the greatest university on earth. I see some Tar Heels. <laughs> um, on campus, I had a great experience, you know, participating in fun clubs and activities. I led our black student movement through the removal of the Confederate monument on our campus. Um, and I also served as senior flat class president when, as soon as COVID-19 hit and turned our senior year right upside down, um, but still graduated at, um, with degrees in political science and religious studies. Chapel Hill is in Orange County, North Carolina. It's our state's healthiest and wealthiest county. In fact, I think just last week, a report ranked Orange County as having the highest life expectancy of any other county in North Carolina. Orange County is also home to UNC Health. Our state's premier hospital system is a very walkable community and is also home to one of the country's first fare-free public transit systems. But conversely, from attending college in one of North Carolina's wealthiest counties, I come from one of North Carolina's poorest counties. About 75 miles northeast of here, about 80 miles east of Raleigh and Chapel Hill, we've been hit the hardest with some of our nation's greatest challenges in Kinston, North Carolina. Some challenges, challenges unique to our community and some share with other communities throughout East North Carolina, like economic struggles due to the loss of major industries, being flooded year after year due to major hurricanes exacerbated by the climate crisis, and then gun violence that is disproportionately affected young people like me. As a result of these issues, Kenton lost nearly 20% of its population from 1990 to 2010, uh, resulting in a number of vacant properties, particularly in downtown and surrounding neighborhoods. Despite these economic hardships, Kenton's, Kinstonians have demonstrated their strength through the ability to reinvent our town's local economy um, by relying on its uh, unique physical, cultural, and social, social assets. In recent years, there's been a renewed focus on reinvigorating our downtown. Um, and the environment surrounding our downtown. We focused on some of our major anchors like our award-winning restaurant, The Chef and the Farmer and our Community Council for the Arts, utilizing a number of successful arts-based economic development and creative place-making initiatives. However, East Kenton, an area just east of downtown and the focus of my organization's work has had more difficulty recovering in comparison to other parts of our town. East Kenton was hit the hardest in recent hurricanes and struggles to regain its footing as we grapple with the issues related to concentrated poverty and crime. This area, one of the main gateways into the city and downtown, would be characterized by outsiders as dilapidated, dilapidated residences, abandoned structures, outdated and dense public housing, and poorly maintained vacant lots. The neighborhood is also dramatically underserved, underserved by commercial enterprises, resulting in scarce employment opportunities and limited access to goods and services for our local residents. We are a food desert. East Kenton has been plagued severely by poverty, crime, and a lack of economic and community development. A 2014 report by the University of North Carolina 
found that census tract 103, which is located in East Kenton, is where my neighborhood, my home is, and is the home to more than 2,000 residents and comprises the geographic bulk and the most densely populated of East Kenton, is ranked the number one most economically distressed census tract out of all of the 2,195 census tracts in the state of North Carolina. These rankings are based on three criteria, poverty rate, per capita income, and unemployment. So when I think of racial capitalism in Eastern North Carolina, I think of my hometown of Kinston, how my grandma worked for decades in textile mills and tobacco warehouses, how her generations and generations before her, her had their labor exploited to fund the wealth of the folks in communities like Raleigh and Chapel Hill. I think about how when these industries found even cheaper and less regulated labor to exploit overseas, they left my family and friends high and dry uh, without income and social safety nets. I think about how in recent years, in the last 20 to 40 years, chicken factories and pork processing plants swooped in, once again, capitalizing on the labor of my friends, my family, my loved ones, all while polluting our environment and not providing safe working conditions at the same time. I love my community, even with its challenges. It's why I returned home from UNC Chapel Hill, even more committed to continuing the work of Kent's and teens and empowering my young peers to be community organizers, leaders, and change makers. It's why in 2021, I ran for and won a seat on my city council and became our state's youngest elected official. Because while the power of the people will always be greater than the people in power, we need people in power who will understand our struggles and want to see transformative change in this region. So as we welcome you into our home, our state, our beautiful Eastern North Carolina, know that we're one with plenty of challenges, but also plenty of opportunities. Opportunities for you to invest in, support us, and work alongside us as we build infrastructure, build community, build political power, and build joy. Thank you. Woo, that was good, y'all. I don't know if that was good to y'all, but that was good to me. Can we get another round of applause? So excited to continue this conversation with you all. And thank you so much for sharing your stories, telling us about where you're from, what you've been doing and how you've been organizing over the last few years. It makes me so overjoyed to get to see you all get to share in this way. Uh, I'm super excited to kind of dive in a little bit more deeply about housing and climate justice, right as we're coming up on hurricane season. Uh, you know, it's right around the corner. And for folks who live in coastal towns, hurricane season is all year long. Whether we're in the season or we're preparing for the season, there's not a time that we don't think about hurricanes. So I'm curious, I'd like to know a little bit more about how communities are responding to both the environmental and climate crisis. And we'll pass it to you, Curtis, to kick us off. So how we're responding to the climate the, um, climate justice and those kind of things. Um, we're dealing with PFAPs that are running through the water and those kind of things on a daily basis. Um, then we're also um, preparing ourselves and our communities to be resilient. I mean, I hate using that term too, but we've got to build those infrastructures because as you all might not know, we started a fund, our a situation called Just Florence. Um, some in, after 2018, when, when the Hurricane Florence came into North Carolina, we were sitting at a, <laughs> we were sitting at a, um, at a restaurant with Aaron Bird and some Blueprint partners. They were like, well, y'all need to just do some something about it. Because I was telling them how they disinvest in our communities when natural disasters happen. And sometimes you just, and sometimes you speak things into existence and then we were able to raise money to really help people re recover. And so those are the activities that we're doing every day. And as so many, um, Darlene and so many other folks talked about, we're still recovering. Even though all this federal money came to Eastern North Carolina to help us recover, it seems like it's being stuck in Raleigh and people's homes are still not being recovered. And this happened in every day, right? We're getting the phone calls after the deadlines, everything. Somebody's calling saying, well, what, what can I do to recover? And it's so important that people with disabilities and people with marginalized situations, they're the ones that are hardest to hit. You and I probably can make the payment to have insurance and properly insured and maybe not have, um, you know, we have those resources, but in our communities, it's important for us to prepare because I was giving people um, disaster kits and then it dawned on me, they were using the disaster kit to live every day. So then you'd have to go back and give them another kit when it was time for disaster. So it's like, it's always constantly engaging with them to make sure they have the resources to, to, um, to overcome their challenges. 
Miss Darlene, would you like to hop on in here? I know you're the very first person I call you and Risa when I hear a hurricane is coming around what is going on and how are folks preparing around the climate disaster and the environmental justice stuff that's happening in Eastern North Carolina. Preparing for the hurricane, um, preparing during this time during the hurricane season is difficult for most people now because their houses have not been repaired from 2018. So if your roof, for example, we have one young man who's been right, waiting ever since 2018 to get his roof re repaired. He's part of the rebuild program for North Carolina. He lives in a mold infested house. They continue to promise him that we're on our way. Oh, but you need to send us this one paper. He sends it to them. We have proof that he sent it to them, but he's, he's waiting now another three months and he's still on the list. We have people who have died on that list. And now they're in the Curry community rebuilding the lady's house, but she's dead. She's still eligible for the benefit, but she will never live in that house. So the delivery of relief to the community has been slow, if at all. And so even though we have other nonprofit agencies that help and do some of the repairs, they're just putting Band-Aids on problems because they put a Band-Aid on his roof and the Band-Aid fell in. And there are young children in the home. So what do, what do you do when you don't have the resources and the resources that's supposed to help you never show up? What do you say to someone when that happens? I mean, so much of the work that I've seen, so many of you all support is the work that fills in the gap when government leaves us behind. Mm -hmm. When people's housing isn't taken care of, I've seen the ways that you all have opened up your homes, opened up community spaces, organized folks, um, and continue to provide what they need, and seen the ways that you all have organized government, and would love to hear from you, Ms. Sue Perry Cole, about what does it look like to organize Black voters around housing issues, around new developments that make sure that marginalized voices are considered and included in that decision-making process. Part of our work is holding elected officials accountable. The city council is a seven member city council. Five of those members are African-American and they represent these disinvested neighborhoods. When we go and speak at the public petition portion of the city council meeting, we're staring in front of people who represent our communities and we're saying to them, this is what we want you to do. This is what we elected you to do. But there's a tension because there's a lot of money to be made by dislocating these people that live in these under-resourced neighborhoods. And so we have to be persistent and consistent. And I'm here to tell you that we ain't going nowhere. We live there, we're on our home turf, and we're trying to hold on to our residency because this is where we live. I know that's right, Ms. Sue. Given everything that's happening in North Carolina these days, I would love to hear from ULA about what does it mean to organize Black voters in a time where it's becoming increasingly more difficult uh, to get folks out to vote and that the systems that disenfranchise us are growing and growing every day. Sure, sure. So when speaking about, you know, voter outreach, we have to be, you know, very real people talking about gerrymandering. The reason I mentioned gerrymandering in the top of my comments was because racial gerrymandering is a part of the tapestry of North Carolina's quilt of inequities. And so we, as Curtis really mentioned, uh, parties will come to us and ask us to turn out our people for their chosen candidates. And they're, usually their candidates are not us either. So where we're having to do is honesty. When we talk about environmental justice, when we talk about climate justice, when we talk about these actual granular issues, communities know that they are the first targeted right? They know that they're the most overburdened. You can't tell them otherwise. They are the subject matter experts of their issues. So if you're not actually talking about those issues, when you are galvanizing voters, no one wants to vote. 
when you're not talking about that redistricting births the census, which actually makes voting a reality, but they only show up to us to ask for our vote, that is again extracting our brain plantation, right? It's our exploitation that they keep extracting because I just need your labor to march to the polls. I don't need your intelligence in this moment to ask or to question or to threaten the actual structure of the political divide. Let's be real people. And I say this as someone who is independent for a reason, right? So when talking about the landscape of voter apathy, our people know why they don't like the census. It's because the census counted us when we were still enslaved. So it counted our bodies, but not our voices. Our people know the legacy of that. It is literally ingrained in our DNA, even if the knowledge hasn't been passed down, because that too has been erased, critical race theory all, right? So when talking about voting, we have to, and we've had, you, what you see so many folks, not just on this panel, but in this space, have had to get into community. And a lot of us came together in Hurricane Florence. It was not the beginning of our advocacy, but it was the beginning of our relationship and it connecting, not just folks from across Eastern North Carolina, I'm from the West. But I've been in the East since a child, 15 years. I even went to my senior high school prom in Brunswick because they had a little crush on somebody, right? <laughs> Just a little bit, a little bit. And so the, the landscape of we're all tied together, but a storm is what tied all of our stories together. And we had no choice. We were actually doing GOTV. We were doing outreach. Curtis mentioned uh, Aaron. Aaron Dell, uh, raise your hand, please. Raise your hand if you're in here. Courtney Patterson, raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you're in here, these are the individuals at our state table that was moving funds to us and then said, this is not enough because folks are asking you how to live in order to cast their vote. You can't vote if you're displaced. You can't vote if there's no actual mailing box outside the shelter. You can't even get to the shelter if there's discrimination between the vote ads. We were doing that. We were picking people up out the waters who were voters. We don't call them voters. We call them community. And the vote is their political action to revolutionize their community. They're not voters, they're humans. What are we doing? Huh? So when we talk about getting out to vote, that is the action to move the pendulum of change. But the land in our ownership years ago in Reconstruction is how we voted in those 187 Black elected officials. It was the land that birthed the economic power that we were able to create Tulsa's and create Wall Street's and create empires and create Wilmington. And it's not known by its massacre. It's known by its thrivability and the fact that the people were resilient in the face of that atrocity. But we only want to talk about the pain that was riddled on their backs, but we want them to go out and vote. Know your people. And that's what we have to do. And if it is not your people, Trust the messengers who know their people. Give them the credit for knowing their people. Attribute them for knowing their people. They are the authors. And I'd say this is an academic, honey. Listen, come on, professor. What y'all don't know is LA got 15 jobs. Y'all think I got a lot of jobs. LA, 15 of them, and one of them is being a professor. Uh, would love, love to hear from you, Chris. We've talked about voting. We've talked about housing, but we haven't talked about labor. Eastern North Carolina is a head rise of labor organizing of folks who come from factory towns who are talking about what does it mean for us to have better conditions would love to hear from you Chris about what does that look like in Kingston and how are you all supporting those efforts yeah for us recently as a organization that engages both young people and does youth empowerment and civic engagement work but also community development work we realized that so many of the people in the neighborhoods we work in are employed by these industries like at the hog farms or the meat packing, meat packing plants or the um, pork processing plants that we know are not good for our environment. Yes, they in some ways provide food that we all enjoy from grocery stores, but the processes of making that food and the pollutions that they do to our riverways, the Cape Fear River, the Noose River, um, you know, that is not good for our local neighborhoods, our local communities. So a lot of our work recently has been trying to engage people in clean jobs, green jobs, and jobs that better serve our community. Um, we're doing a lot of community development work in East Kent, and one now to address the issue of food insecurity. So what does it look like to have small neighborhood farms, and how can we employ people to get engaged in those economies? How can we employ people to work in the food service industry and get trained to work in serving and preparing food um, that is locally sourced and locally grown and not grown from elsewhere and processed in some very polluting meatpacking industry. So that's been a lot of our work recently, trying to engage folks in both clean and green.
raindrops because we want our people to work. We want our people to have a living wage. We want our people to have safe working conditions. But we know that these current conditions that they're working in at major hog industries like Smithfield Farms or Sanderson Farms and the chicken plant chicken plants in our region um, are not the right place for them. Anybody else on this panel want to jump in on labor conditions? We all come from factory working people. Yes, I'm a, I'm a labor organizer by trade anyway. Um, I, uh, I'm a student of labor, I guess it seems like. So I tried to let, let do some labor organizing 20 some years ago at, at the biggest hog farm, hog place in the state of North Carolina in the world in, in Tar Heel. And so I understand the importance of labor organizing in community. And I tell you, it's hard to do that work um, of labor organizing because you've got the economic, the economic will of folks to have a job. But then you've got the environmental need that they need to actually be, and help need that they need to be alive. And let me say that again: that you got to be alive when you finish the job, and you got to have a, you got to have your limbs, you got to have all of those things <laughs> to enable to function. Because if any of you all have ever worked in a hog farm, I mean a hog processing plant, those conditions are not suitable for anybody to to work in one day, more or less, for a lifetime. Because if Will looks at that, we're able to see the disabilities that come out of those experiences that not only affect them, but it affects generations of their families. So you've got to understand that piece. And then when we're talking about labor organizing, in the 60s when we had textile mills, because in North Carolina, they did not want to have a labor organizing in the 60s and the 50s. So out of that piece, that brings us to the resistance in North Carolina now to be a right to work state, and which is hard to do labor organizing because they don't value the rights of the worker in our state. The rights that I'm a worker and I'm working for you, that, and I have a right to do that. And you have, a, you have a responsibility to treat me a certain way. This is what we're trying to, when we're doing organizing in that way, is that you respect the worker and also respect their identity and their humanity. Because if you care about my health, you care about me. It's not so much money, how much money you put in the community. It's about what you're doing for your everyday workers. Because you know, they write nice checks when you need them for some kind of want to look good. But what are they doing in our community every day? They're, they're, they're contaminating our water. They're contaminating our water that we drink. Do you realize you're not supposed to be drinking the water in Wilmington right now? I'm just being real, y'all. So y'all better have a bottle of water around here. <laughs> it's serious. I'm trying to tell you this is that serious. Because in plants and things in my community, they're closed now. But because people were drinking the water there, they had high, high um, cancer rates in those because people were fishing in those ponds. They had no idea. This is what we're talking about. Labor organizing is folks working there. They don't realize it. So it's important for us to be the mouthpiece to explain to folks what they're experiencing. Listen, listen, y'all ain't heard that man. Don't you drink this here water? I think that's something we hear all over the South, right? Is our water clean? Can we stay in this house? Is my community safe? Where can I go to school? Is there a grocery store in my neighborhood? We've heard so much all over the South, right? Shout out to the folks over at Lyft that are doing big labor organizing, a Mexican that's doing big labor organizing, right? That are also seeing these other intersections. So as we wrap up our panel, I wanna leave y'all with one of my favorite questions that my favorite funder asked me, what do y'all need? In this moment, if you sat with yourself, shout out to Threshold, what do you need? What do you need from each other? What do you need from the folks in this room and what, what are you giving and how can we support you in that? We need perseverance. We need to hang tough right now. This is a very difficult period in our nation's history. In North Carolina, we have a Republican dominated legislature and they are turning the clock back in so many different areas. We need to uh, come together coordinate our efforts so that we can leverage our strength and we need investment to continue to keep going forward. 
We need long-term investment in Eastern North Carolina. Say it again. We need long-term investment in Eastern North Carolina. Say it one more time. We need long-term investment in Eastern North Carolina. Okay. And when I say long-term, I'm not talking about five years. Uh -huh. I'm not talking about 10 years. Uh -huh. I'm talking about 20, 30 years down the line okay. in order us to build power in community. And when it comes to that investment, I want to be very specific with, with two things. Uh, one of those, we were in a conversation yesterday with some of the Amplify grantees in East North Carolina and uh, Miss Risa Willis, who, if y'all can't tell, is one of our favorite people amongst all of us. <laughs> you know, she asked the question, you know, how many of us in this room rent the space that you, your organization uses, your, whether it's your office, your meeting space, whatever? And I think half the room raised their hands that we rent our space. We need money to buy property. Our organizations, our communities deserve to own our land. And then not only to own that land, though, to be able to have the resources to cultivate that land, whether that's for farming and gardening or to build physical spaces for us to operate out of and serve our communities and meet in. Because when you start organizing, whether that's doing labor organizing, political organizing, trying to build community power, folks don't want you to rent out their meeting spaces because you're working against their interests and the things that they're exploiting you for. So we need our own spaces in our community. Thank you for that. Secondly, though, we also need money year round. We don't just need programmatic support and civic engagement support when it comes to elections. Um, 2022's uh, local, you know, uh, midterm elections, I think our organizations in Eastern North Carolina, we, some of us started turning away money because it was just so much. It was so overwhelming because of how much people want you to go to get out and get folks to vote. But then come January, once the election, the polls are closed, and now we're back to the, the, the cold of winter and trying to struggle to help folks pay their light bills and pay their heating expenses, we have little to no money for regular programmatic services for our community or general operating support for our organizations. So not only do we need support for those civic engagement things and things around election cycles, we need the money to be able to do organizing in our communities all year long. So please support us year round. We also need investment in our staff and the people that work for nonprofits. We need investment in benefits for the, for the leaders. We need 401k plans. We don't get money for to invest in the staff, in the human capital. We get no money for that. So if we're not careful, the people that we are now serving, we will become one of those people because there are no benefits there for us. So please invest in us in Eastern North Carolina. You know, that is such a plus one, first of all. Um, I always ask the question back, what is your wealth plan for community? You have to define what wealth is with the community. But wealth is not digging out of a hole that keeps on opening up like a pit. Wealth is when you do purchase land, it doesn't need to be on a brownfield or a Superfund site. It needs to be healthy, thriving land that we can actually survive on without cancer clusters, asthma, lung and bronchial issues. We don't need the cheap land, the extracted land that was abused during slavery when we were abused, because that's what's cheap right now. We need the thriving, healthy land so we don't have to economically rent it out to the Smithfields when they want to raise you know, pork on our land. When we talk about wealth planning and retirement planning, what is dignified and what is actually wealth building? Wealth building is not trying to run an election cycle and that's it and you don't care how folks are surviving throughout the year. That's not wealth building. What about when folks are saying like when we say Cancer Alley and I connect it to what's happening in Eastern North Carolina, folks have said, I wanna leave because a lot of the land that our people ran to was not the land we chose. So while we stay there and we're resilient there and we're okay with loving and living there, we didn't choose that swamp land. It chose us because it protected us and we knew nobody could get to us through that swamp land. Is that well? So as we're talking about what are the resources that we need, long-term engagement, even this government funding, largest, you know, most money we've received in the history of North Carolina, environmental justice monies. I appreciate the first black man in the US EPA who has actually created this office that nobody else created, who comes from North Carolina and the Coal Ash area, giving honor where honors due. But the way government is, there is no corporate accountability. 
but there's also no pipeline to move actual funding to our communities, even though it says it's for our communities. There's no enforcement mechanism. There's no actual mediaries, and they haven't supported all of us as organization leaders or community organizers with being prepared with the infrastructure to receive multi-million dollar grants, but these quasi-governmental orgs can. So as funders, we need y'all's help for technical capacity. We need your help to actually help us do the grant writing. We need your help to get low, legal uh, folks who can read the government contracts so we ain't up in jail because we ain't never done this before. Well, here, That's what so. we need. And then that pipeline to actually give us the money pipeline the money directly to us. That's a part of that 50 year, 100 year investment is because this is 50 year, 100 year money. But it's gonna go to what orgs can do what fast in three months, sams.gov, we don't know what that is. How many of us have navigated that? Not many of us. And if we have, who says we've actually been approved? So there's infrastructure issues that has impeded our ability to ascend on wealth and to actually get reparations. Because my mom always said, their old money is our money. But I'm gonna leave that right there. Listen. <laughs> I just want to. You know, I don't like that. You call, you're making true. me accountable, self That's accountable. True. I like you. I like, what's your name? That's that, Morgan. Oh, you know, Sha just said you got to meet Morgan before we got up here. Okay, and let's see this, look at this. Y'all, what do we need? You know, I think the painful part is we tell our stories. And it's our stories and we extract it and it's used in an analysis model. And we've gotten so used to separating us from our impact, but it's the same people. And um, sometimes I look at my elders who have invested in me and being that my people, I have ancestors who moved to the East. That was a part of Soul City years ago, but I'm from the West and these folks took me in. And I want to see them, and this is a me statement because this is my life's work. This is what I was called to do. And so if I don't see them retire in dignity because they don't have the funding to retire in dignity, I didn't do anything because they should have to keep moving until there's, there's no more but rest and transition on the other side. That's unacceptable. And so my grandmama feed into me and I just lost her in December. Her and my mom are the reason I do this work. So for me, I can be at peace and rest and create radical rest for myself if my spirit is resting. Because my body can be still, but my mind can keep moving. A part of what keeps moving is the fact that my people have to get up every single day. My elders who have been doing this for generations, decades, there is no retirement plan for them, but they've given everybody else life. Where is theirs? And that's for me, because I know then it'll be in place for me. And then I can rest and enjoy here in my people before I do my next journey on the other side. Come on, y'all. I think I, I need to say that I'm one of the people on this panel with white hair. <laughs> and that means that I'm probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest. I need to see the next generation of leadership. That's Chris. That's a better chance, a better community. Another one of our partners that focuses on youth empowerment. I need to know that there's somebody else behind me that I can pass the baton to, and then I can get in my rocker in the rest home and look out the window and see Chris and others doing the job. That's what I need. You know what we really need? We need capacity building in our communities. We need that for our organizations to take it to the next level. Right, because all of us have other things that we do, as uh, Shai would say, or LA would say, we've all got these other things that we do. But the most important thing that we need is we need you to trust us. I need you to trust me because you all might not know me, but, but something about trust happens with me. And I'll just give you a little quick story about trust for me. I'm adopted to a lady who was a freedom fighter in her own right, a labor organizer in her own right. She was a work for the post office and did all that kind of stuff as a postmaster. And she trusted me with some things before she passed away. And she told me that you've got to do this thing. You've got to help your community. You've got to do it and you can't worry about what people are going to say. 
You got to stand when nobody stands with you. See, these are the folks that are in the room with you today. These are folks that take great risk for their own personal safety as well as their community's safety. I'm telling the truth, y'all. Y'all, for me anyway, I don't know about y'all, but I, if for me, I had to stand when nobody was standing there, y'all. When my home, when my home was placed on by Oath Keepers on the Facebook with a with a mark around it, I'm telling you what I know. I'm not telling you what somebody else says, but I'm telling you what I experienced. But then I think about it and I say, in the midst of these storms of life, God is still with me. Right? As we sit here at at 1898, and we go look out, and we can see the bloody, because y'all got to realize that was blood down the Cape Fear River that day. That was blood of our ancestors that were there. How is it that we're right back at the same moment in time again in history again? Because some of us fail to pass the baton. It's not just about writing a check. It's about you got to trust me that I can really do and change my community and that my community has the power to transform itself. Because I don't know, I really don't know what my community will need in 20 and 30 years, but somebody behind me knows what it's going to need. And you got to trust them that they're going to make those decisions for the betterment of their community. You know, when I think of what, what I need as an individual, I, I do think back to what Ms. Darlene said in her answers to the previous question um, about retirement and support for her staff. You know, I need the financial security to keep doing this work. Um, when I graduated from college in 2021, um, I took a job with a, a major organization based in Raleigh, and I had great benefits, an amazing salary. I was enjoying my time straight out of college, making nice money, but the work wasn't just, it wasn't completely fulfilling to me. I knew my heart was in, at home in Kenton, and I wanted to be doing community organizing at home in Kenton. So I took a sub substantial change in my, my personal economy to come back home and do this work in my community because I care so much about it. And it's a struggle. It is truly a struggle, to, you know, at times to have, you know, colleagues, friends and, and, you know, friends and colleagues and stuff who are making much more money working for major organizations or working in the private sector and able to travel and have, you know, all these, these fun things with their life. But I'm back home in Kenton because I care so much about my community. I want to see the change happening, but I'm not making any money. I, I, I'm being supported by my parents still because I care so much about this work. So it is a very difficult circumstance, I think, for a lot of young folks in Eastern North Carolina who care about our communities, who care about our homes and want to see change here. But all the opportunities are in Raleigh and Charlotte and other metropolitan areas. And, you know, we don't have the funds and the social safety nets to stay at home. So um, I need the money. I need the financial security and my peers need that financial security so that we can stay in rural East North Carolina and be the change that we want to see in our communities. Say, Ms. Darling, you want to pop on in and give a little quick what you need? You got I already it. said what I needed. <laughs> <laughs> Again, what Curtis said about trust in us, I I'm 100% for the trust in us, trusting that we're going to do the right things with the funding that you give us. Trust us enough to make sure the education or the capacity building and what we're doing, even though you don't understand our plan, sit down with us. Take the time to understand the plan. Don't make assumptions. Make sure that you understand it. And again, I'm going to say, Wealth building, retirement plans are necessary. Affordable insurance, paying insurance premium for the staff is necessary. They don't need to go through because they want it to help somebody else. We need funding specifically directed at that alone. Well, thank you y'all for this amazing panel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Miss Sue, 
Miss Darlene, Chris, Curtis, LA, Shy.